to ask you, if you would, to go ahead and take out your sermon outline, take out your Bible, and uh, go ahead and turn to Titus. And if you don't have a sermon outline, just lift your hand, and these gentlemen will be glad to give you one. In the life of our church, we study the Bible very carefully. If you are joining us online, we want you to know that there's a button that you can click just below to download and hopefully even print out the notes that are there. The way that we preach and the way that we teach will make so much more sense since we go very deep into the Word of God and seek to understand what it is that he said and how he is speaking to us. Well, before we turn to Titus exactly, I just want to celebrate something in the life of our church. And um, last Friday night, there was an event. It was the Southeast Asia Missions event. Uh, We had a banquet just a couple of nights ago, and it was a beautiful time where the, the mission team shared song and scripture and word as they challenged us to pray and to give so that they can go. Now, I want you to notice this. We had a goal. We had a goal over this last few months in raising the money for them to go. And what was the goal? $20,000. And I want you to see what has been given. $28,500. Praise the Lord. I rejoice that we are part of a church that has a heart for the gospel to go to the nations. May God bless this endeavor. And not only this endeavor. You say, well, what about that $8,500? That's pretty great. I guess they get to stop off by Tahiti on their way home. (laughs) No. Um, Instead, what we do is we will take that and forward that to our next trip. And some of you have been saying, Pastor, I should have signed up for that thing. I I should have gone. I would like to go. Well, let me tell you that this next year, we're going to have a couple of more opportunities. We know that we've been called and asked to come back to France um, to share the gospel, to share Bibles uh, with Muslims um, from the areas of North Africa and the Middle East and Europe. And so we'll be going back to do that. And I want to encourage you now to be saying, Lord, use me. Lord, prepare something that I can give this next year so that we may continue to go. Well, we've been studying this little power stick of, the, of Titus, the beautiful book of the Bible that is only three chapters long, long yet has such a powerful punch in it. And um, this morning, our passage comes to an issue that um, is not a, an issue that we think about very much here in America, other than the fact that it's part of our past. We're going to look at Titus as he deals with slaves, slaves that are even in the church. And we're going to title this Radical Slaves, the Transformative Gospel in Radical Slavery as God would work and move through them. Now notice a couple of weeks ago we looked at older men. That passage deals with older men. We also looked at older and younger women. The passage deals with how should older and younger women um, live their lives. Young men, what was the key words for young men? What is it? I mean, it was very short. What were the key words for young men? Self-control. Very good. And um, we looked last week, just last week, at the fact that when Paul is giving instructions to the people of Crete and to the churches of Crete, he is not leaving out the elders, the pastors, the spiritual leaders of the church. They're part of the congregation. So we said even elders. Well, today we come to the passage that deals with radical slaves. And so let's review. For those of you who are new to us this morning, we want you to see where we've been. This message will make so much more sense if you just kind of look at the context of where we've been. First of all, the book of Titus is all about this, and I'm going to ask you to kind of fill in three things here this morning. But notice this, that the apostle Paul has left missionary Titus. He's a missionary being left there missionary Titus, on the island of Crete, that's in the Mediterranean, to straighten out wayward churches. These were churches that were wayward. These were churches that had major problems. And what were the problems that these churches had? They had three problems, and I'm going to give you a moment to force your brain to remember these three things. Testing is very good. Don't say anything yet. I know some of you are eager beavers and you want to do this. Listen, don't say anything. Go ahead and fill in the three things that were major problems in the churches of Crete. See if you can get one or two or three of them. You know any of those? One or two or three of them. When we force our minds to remember, um, it it does very good for our learning. 
So the first thing that we want to say is the churches had problematic leaders. They had problematic leaders. Uh, their leaders were self-absorbed. Their leaders were not in it for God, but for themselves. The second thing that they had problem with was doctrine. Because their leaders were off, their doctrine was off. The truth was not being properly taught. Now, I've given you two of them. So leaders and doctrine, what else was wrong in the churches of Crete? Very good. Behavior. Behavior was a problem. They weren't living like Christians. So in Titus 1, 1 through 5, um, or 5 through 9, we see that Titus is told to appoint godly elders, godly pastors. And those godly pastors are going to be known by two things, their character and their doctrine. Not only that, we see that he's told to get rid of something. He's told to get rid of the ungodly, fake deceivers that are in the churches currently. And so very often we're, when you're going to deal with churches that are having a hard time, you have to deal with the church leaders that are there that have contributed to the problem that now exists. Notice the next part. In Titus chapter 2, the focus changes from leaders to the congregation. So we go from leaders to the congregation. And as we go from leaders to the congregation, Titus is given certain instructions by the Apostle Paul concerning the older men, the younger, the older women, the younger women, the young men, Titus, what we saw last week, and today, what we see, the slaves that are there. So fill that in, the slaves. Now, it's very important that you see the next phrase that is there just above the big black line. I want us to get this. The life of church members is to, dis is to be distinctly Christian while still in the surrounding culture. The life of church members, those who are in the church, that's including the pastors, that's including the deacons, that's including the elders, the, the leadership, that's also including all of the church members, it is God's design that we would be distinct from the culture, that we would be distinctly Christian as opposed to distinctly worldly. As, even though we still live in and breathe and move in the present culture around us. He hasn't called us to retreat from culture. He simply called us to be Christian in whatever culture we, are, we find ourselves in this world. And we can do that. By his strength, we can do that. Daniel was doing that. We see that throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, God's people are called to be distinctly God's people amidst a world that is lost. You see, when we are distinctly Christian or when we are distinctly godly, fill this in, this is a powerful witness to the world. This is a powerful statement to the people that are around us because they are watching our lives. And when we are able to be in the culture but not of the culture, Jesus said to be in the world but not of the world, then we are showing them what he is calling for his people to be. So now, as we, as we see this passage and as we deal with this passage, we see that slavery comes up because there are slaves in the churches that are all across the Mediterranean and all around the Roman world. Notice with me here, Titus chapter 2, and the box is there on the, on the page, and I want you to see here. In Titus chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, but as for you, teach what accords with what? Very good, sound doctrine. And we've circled each one of these as we've gone through um, each week. In verse 2, it's older men. In verse 3, it's older women with instructions. Verse 4, young women. Verse 6, it's younger men. Last week, verse 7, it's yourself, Titus. That's him. And now at the bottom of that first column, it's verse 9 is what? Slaves. Now here's the instructions that are given to slaves. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Look at verse 10 at the end. So that in everything they may adorn. Circle the word adorn. We're going to look at that. 
They may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Now, look at verse 11. The huge reason for that very difficult two verses is found in verse 11, 12, 13, 14. Look what it says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. See, it doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter what your station is in life. doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been. It's saying salvation is available to everyone, to all people. Verse 12 training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Verse 15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. And so the great reason of us, for us, to live, in this case, if we are slaves, to live radical lives that go against the norm is to show Christ. I want us to see that in this morning. As we look at the issue, um, of slavery, there's some things that I, I think are really important for us to, to recognize as Christians, even here in 2018, in the modern world in which we live. And um, there's so much. There, there's, there's sermons and series and seminars, and there's, there's books that can be written on every single one of the statements that I'm about to make. And I want you to see this. I want us as Christians, I want us as Bible-believing, Christ-following Christians here in South Florida in this present age, I want us to know how to look at slavery around the world, not only around the world, but through all of human history. I think that we need to have a very good theology of slavery because it comes up, it pops up. And in, in, in the midst of our racial injustices, in the midst of the prejudice that we see even in our own culture, it is good for Christians to be well informed as we look and as we think about the evils of, as such as slavery. I want you to know that not all slavery was race-based. There were some slaveries that were not race-based, that were more economic and simply who was there when we came. It was even people within their own countries and their own cultures which sometimes would be brought into slavery, um, sold into slavery. There are some, there's, uh, there's, normal, there's uh, various types of slavery, some in which there is man-stealing and where some are gone and captured and taken from one place to another, and then there's other types of slavery that have to do with like indentured servants, that have to do with settling debts, that have to do with a bond uh, that has to be paid before you're free once again. And so there's, there's many different types in this, but however it goes, there's some statements that Christians need to understand concerning slavery in the big picture as we deal with this. The first thing I want you to notice here, and there's actually two statements in this, in this first line, is that slavery is a societal evil that true Christianity ultimately reduced. Slavery is a societal evil that true Christianity ultimately reduced. Now, it doesn't eliminate it, Slavery has not been eliminated. Slavery is still in action today. And slavery is in action with millions of people today out of the seven plus billion people on the planet. Slavery is not dead. Slavery is still alive. And we need to recognize that. It's in, in fact, there's aspects of slavery that are still alive in this state and in this county. There are aspects of human trafficking and slavery that are still in line today. And so I, I want us to recognize that this hasn't been eliminated. This hasn't been reduced. But one of the important things for us to recognize is that while there's been numerous influences that have led toward a reduction of slavery in humankind, I want you to see here that some of the great power hitters in this were true Christians. 
I'm not talking about cultural Christians. I'm not talking about people who said that they followed Christ but did not. But by and large, there was true Christians that were very passionate about the gospel that very often had a very real impact on reducing the level and the movement and the horror of slavery in human history. So society is a, excuse me, slavery is a societal evil. It's wrong, it's not right, and it's been reduced by Christians. Notice the next statement there. Our world has such great evils as slavery. And there's various injustices and various oppression. What about the great evil of war? The great evil of war. The, the, this is part, and this all is because of, you can fill this in, our fallenness from God. We have these grand evils that are still alive and well in humanity. War is not over. It's not finished. We live in an age where there's still war, there's still oppression, there's still injustice, and there is still slavery. And all of this comes from one place, our fallenness from God. This is part of life in a fallen world. Notice the next statement that is here. The awful wickedness of slavery would never have come into being were it not for man's spiritual bankruptcy at the fall. Spiritual bankruptcy at the fall. What is bankruptcy? Bankruptcy is when it's all gone, right? In fact, it's all wiped out, and in true bankruptcy, the statement is the ledger goes to zero right? This is what bankruptcy is. Well, when we talk about spiritual bankruptcy, what we're talking about is, is that there, there is not a picture where there's, there's goodness that's still there and flowing from our wicked hearts, that we see into the condition of mankind, that we come to a place where everything about us and in us and through us that flows as part of who we are is evil. I want you to see this with me all the way back from Genesis chapter 9. And notice the screen in front of me. Um, Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, look what is written in Genesis 9 concerning our spiritual bankruptcy. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. This is, this is Noah offering up a sacrifice after the flood. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from when? Wow. <laughs> now, is there any question that your child has a little evil heart as they come out and they start growing? I mean, they just ought to, do you have to teach children to do the wrong thing? Do you have to teach children to do the right thing? Yes. I mean, th th throughout human uh, development and throughout human growth, we see that we gravitate toward evil. We see that we, we don't automatically have a pure heart. Look what it says, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 3. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. So you want to know where all the evil comes from? Look at this. The same de destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterward, they join the dead. Now, this is the wisdom literature of Proverbs, excuse me, of Ecclesiastes, next to Proverbs. And, and we see in this wisdom literature, it is saying and it's revealing that, yes, the world is evil. And the world, I mean, we can't just blame it all on the devil. We can't just blame it all on someone else. We see that in every human heart that our hearts are filled with evil needing. And, in fact, madness, it says, in fact, needing a Savior. Look at Jeremiah 17, 9. This is one of the main go-to verses concerning the evil condition of the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Um, you see, that's not just your spouse's heart that sometimes when, you're, when you just look at them and you go, I don't understand how they think this way. I don't understand them. No, no, it's your heart too. It's my heart too. 
that here, this is the picture of why we so desperately need a Savior. Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jesus said these words. This is where all of those things come from. They come from the heart. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 on the screen. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to what? The hardness of their heart. You see, we have a heart problem, and that's why we need the ultimate heart surgeon, who is indeed the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and give us a new heart. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and restore, just come and restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's what God does when he comes, and he gives his people a new heart. So there's, there's even more verses there. You could write out there to the side Romans 1 and 2. I think that's actually there. There's, there's this picture of spiritual bankruptcy, and you want to know where slavery comes from? It comes from spiritual bankruptcy of our fallen nature. Now look at the next part there. God's long-range redemptive plan, God's long-range redemptive plan focuses on solving the root of our spiritual problem. That's our sin guiltiness. That's our, that's our heart problem. He focuses on solving the root of our spiritual problem more than his focus is on redeeming the corrupted political and societal structures of this present age. God does not come to fix all of the broken power struggle of politics in this world. God does not come to redeem all of the things in this world, including all of our societal problems, even like slavery. Now, praise God that when people come to God and begin to live the way he says to live and begin to reflect his image in their behavior, the society gets better. The society gets better, and some of these great evils begin to fall as God's people are changing culture from down deep within their lives and who they are and the way that they live. No doubt we see the beauty of that. Our nation has been blessed with that in many ways. Sure, we started off with difficulties, and there's all kinds of injustices and evils and even wars that were, that were a part of that in our own land, but there have been some really powerfully beautiful blessings that have come from America seeking to be a Christian nation. Now, there's, there's great, great flaws in that yet, there are great flaws in that still, but we see that whenever a people begin to reflect God's values and begin to reflect God's things, there are certain blessings of peace and justice that come because God is a God of peace and a God of justice. But nevertheless, we see that this state of our world is still in a state of fallenness. So notice this with me, that, that God does not come and take away all of those injustices and all of those difficulties. The last statement that I want you to see on the front page is this. Roman slavery was a massive issue. Just right above that, 20 million. There was roughly 20 million slaves in the Roman Empire um, estimated when this letter was written from Paul to Titus. And that slavery was often a brutal slavery. The Greeks had been brutal. Of course, the Assyrians and the Phoenicians and, and many other cultures throughout the Mediterranean world had been brutal. But the Romans were very brutal in this. Now, they had some aspect of it where Rome wasn't as bad as some of the others. But nevertheless, whenever there was a slave uprising, you see, that became a political thing that became a societal instability, and the great power of Rome would come and crush whatever happened. There were uprisings, national uprisings, and there were sometimes slave rebellions that would come up, and Rome would come in and brutally crush that kind of uprising. As Christianity grew and Rome was falling, those two things were happening very close together. As Christianity grew and Rome fell, so did slavery in most areas. So you remember with me, as Rome fell and, and Christianity rises up, 
the church became more, more prominent, and even Christianity did. Now, we also know that there was, a, there was a state authorization of the church which began to corrupt the church, corrupt the church horribly. But even under that setting, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, slavery was being reduced. Again, I want you to see this. Slavery reemerges in European cultures and then spread to America. And so as uh, we go through the colonial period of, of Europe's uh, empire, um, we see that slavery comes into Europe and then it's also in America and very, very much part of that. But I want you to notice this. Again, I want us to see that true Christianity was instrumental in abolishing slavery in both Europe as well as America. And where do we get that from? I want you to notice this. England, William Wilberforce was one of the main, one is one of the main people that God used to outlaw slavery in the United Kingdom. And not only William Wilberforce, but also William Pitt. William Pitt, these two men worked together. Pitt died before Wilberforce. But here they got to see, finally, as part of the great um, thrust of their lives for the Abolishment Act in England. I want you to hear William Wilberforce's statement here. The first quote I want you to see, and it's on the screen in front of you. He wrote, there are four things, there are four things that we ought to do with the Word of God. Admit it as the Word of God. Commit it to our hearts and minds, as we saw this morning. Submit to it, that means obey it, and do what? and transmit it to the world. We've been talking about that this morning. That God has called us. You see, William Wilberforce was saved through God's grace as a young man and began to see that God is the high king of heaven that has called men to hear his voice and to obey it. And he began to obey God. And when he began to look and he saw the injustice of slavery in the United Kingdom, in, in England, he started to say, this must stop. This must be abolished. We are better than this. They are better than this. And so he stood and he said no to this. So notice the next quote that is here. This is what he would say about slavery. So enormous, so dreadful, so irre irredeemable did the slave trade's wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest until I had effected its abolition. That was a man of God and a man of faith that put action to his convictions of what the Bible says in Christianity, the love of Christ. Not only was it William Wilberforce and William Pitt, but also in America, two preachers had an enormous impact in the whole abolition movement. Um, these men pricked the conscience of the American states and the American people. Notice this, John Wesley would preach hard against slavery. George Whitfield would preach hard against slavery. They did not let it rest. And as they preached against it, the tide began to turn and people began to walk away from the wickedness of slavery. I want you to see here, and to flip your sheet over, that God has been working in his redemptive plan of a fallen world. He is working and he's moving in this in order to bring about the change that he is going to ultimately see come um, as he fulfills his will in the world of bringing the return of Christ. Now, post-millennialism would look at this and say, wow, things are getting better. Certain things are dropping off. Certain things are being um, quelled in the world. Um, and I, I tend not to be a post-millennialist. I tend to not view everything as getting better and better and better. In fact, I think that at Matthew chapter 24 describes a world that's going to be under great turmoil and great trouble um, before the return of Christ. But we can, we can look and we can see that certain things certainly do, um, by God's grace, are, are reduced 
uh, in their evil and in their difficulty in certain sectors of the world as God's truth is proclaimed. I want you to see here, first of all, um, Old Testament laws. Old Testament laws regarding slavery made the Israelites radically different than other nations. Old Testament laws regarding slavery made the Israelites radically different than other nations. Man stealing was profoundly and clearly illegal, um, and anyone who did that was put to death. The treatment of slaves under the law, the the giving away of slaves, the, the freedom that would be given to slaves. We look at Acts, Exodus chapter 21, Leviticus chapter 25, uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Each one of these, if you were to compare what was going on with God's people in the midst of this fallen world to the nation surrounding Israel, you would say, oh, wow. There is a very big difference in the way God's people were dealing with this, and, evol and eventually would, it would fall away from God's people as we come into the New Testament era. We see this. Notice here with me, the New Testament re teaching regarding slaves brought societal revolution through spiritual change. It brought societal revolution through spiritual change. And this affected, that societal revolution has been affecting issues such as slavery. Let me give you another example of this that we're not mentioning here. One of the other examples would be the idea of polygamy. Think about polygamy with me. It was, it was there in the, New in the Old Testament, and we see that, that this is a, a part of the picture that we see that God's people are dealing with this. And, and as time goes on, we see polygamy not being elevated, not being um, uh, approved and affirmed from each generation to the next. And then when we come to the New Testament, we see that polygamy has died away, and we see the design of God's plan for one man, one woman, one lifetime being upheld as the glorious picture of, that, of what God has designed. And then we see, we fast forward all through Christian history to where we are today, polygamy is... is is disregarded and it is not accepted among Christians. And so we see there are certain things that as time goes on, we do see progress and we see change upon them. Um, first excuse me, First Corinthians, Romans 6, Galatians 3, John 18, each one of these deal with the issue of slavery in the New Testament. And in, it, in each event, we see that it is a spiritual approach. And this is what we need to see this morning, is that when God is dealing with the issues, he's dealing with the root of the problem. God wants to deal with the root of the problem in your marriage. God wants to deal with the root of the problem in your vocation. God wants to deal with the root of the problem in your parenting. You know, we always want to deal with the surface issues, the things that are up there. You know, pastor, can you, can you help me just make it through this? It, I want my, my family to stop doing this, or I want my husband to stop doing this, or I want my wife to stop doing this. Well, very often, the, the real picture is that we need to deal with what's under the surface. Why are we acting like this? Why are we doing this? What is the spiritual reason um, that, is, that is causing our behavior in this way? We see the God's word that he brings about revolution from the spiritual side of life. Now, I'm amazed at God's sovereignty in the story of Philemon. Uh, the Apostle Paul, and we're, I want you to see this because this passage right here perhaps is the most powerful passage that brought societal change as Christianity grew concerning slavery. Um, just kind of get the, get the lay of the land here. The Apostle Paul is ministering in, in Ephesus. About 100 miles from Ephesus is a city called Colossae. And a rich man named Philemon became a Christian when Paul was ministering in Ephesus. So he becomes a Christian. He starts growing in the Lord. Things are going really, really well in, in this early first century Christianity movement. And Philemon even becomes a guy who would have people come and worship at his home. People would come. They would do house church there, kind of like community groups. They would do these things there at Philemon's home. And so Paul moves away from Ephesus. He winds up in prison in Rome. And while he's in prison in Rome, 
he comes across a young man and somehow, some way, we don't know yet, when we get to heaven, we'll find out, a, a young man named Onesimus. And Onesimus becomes a Christian. And as Onesimus becomes a Christian, Paul finds out that Onesimus was actually Philemon's slave from over in Colossae. And so he is, he is serving with Paul. Onesimus is helping Paul, encouraging Paul. He's growing in the Lord. He becomes Paul's dear friend. And as Paul finds out that Onesimus belongs to Philemon, eventually he comes and he says, let's deal with Philemon. And so this tiny little letter, and it's in fact the very next um, few pages in your Bible from Titus, it, this tiny little letter comes and it shows. And I've kind of titled this passage sometimes in my own heart, The Slave That Changed the World. Onesimus changed the world, and it's in a most unlikely way. I want you to see here, Paul writes to Philemon, and he writes regarding the runaway slave Onesimus who probably stole from Onesimus, stole from Philemon as he left, and there were things that he had taken, maybe money or property, whatever it was, but however it went, he had run away. Notice here with me these words in verse 8. Philemon 8. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, you see, Paul had led Philemon to the Lord, and he's saying, Philemon, I could tell you to do these things, but look what he says in verse 9. Yet for love's sake, can you circle those two words? For love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my child. Underline that. My child, Onesimus. So Paul's not just saying, my friend, He's not just saying, maybe this servant, this servant-hearted guy that's been helping me, he calls him his child, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you. Now, that could be for two reasons. Number one, he maybe had a really bad attitude and there were lots of problems, or it was because he had run away. He didn't have him anymore. So formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. Verse 12, I am sending him back to you, sending my what? Wow, isn't that beautiful? I'm sending Onesimus back to, Onesimus back to you, sending my very heart. Verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but out of your own accord. And you see, there's a few different things going on here. Onesimus is on dangerous ground because if he gets caught, he could be put to death. That, you know, slavery hasn't budged in the Roman culture yet. Slavery is still the order of the day, and the rule over this is still very powerful. And so Paul sees this, and Onesimus is in Rome trying to hide out. Onesimus gets saved. They build a relationship. He disciples him along. And so now Paul is starting to look at the whole situation and saying, not only is Philemon my friend and my, my brother in Christ, and Onesimus is too, but Onesimus is on dangerous ground. Notice the next part that is here. Um, he says, for this reason, for this, or verse 15, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while. This is perhaps why he left from you, that you might have him back, I love it, forever. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. The Onesimus became a Christian, and now he's coming back to you. And look at verse 16. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, I love this, as a beloved what? Brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Wow. In verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 
Verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owning me, your, even your own self. He's saying, don't forget, Philemon, you owe me your life. You heard the gospel through me, and so I and call you with the same love and service and love that you have for me that you give it to him. Look at verse 20. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. So he's saying, I mean, this is like one of those letters that's just flowing with love and grace, and he's calling Philemon to just be loving and generous and grace and to accept Onesimus back as a brother in Christ forever. Now, there are so many different things and so many different ideas that you can say. You see, I want us to see that God's way of dealing with our spiritual problems and even our societal problems are seeking to deal with the root of them. And Paul is appealing as a Christian and as a brother to come into this. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is writing to the Corinthian people and he's saying, hey, if you're a slave and in the Corinthian church, if you can get your freedom, get your freedom. If you can find it, I mean, if you can ask for it, ask for it. If you can, if you can come to that place of, of being free in these things, do that, obtain it. But if, if that's not readily available, then you serve with distinction for God. He's, he's saying that it is better to be a true Christian in whatever state that you're found in order to show the world Christ. Now notice the next statement that is on your outline. Christian slaves and the rest of us, Christian slaves and the rest of us, that means at work, that means at home and family relationships. Listen to this. When you're laying in the hospital bed with cancer, when you're in pain, when you're in struggle, when there's, when there's difficulties come, Christian slaves and the rest of us, whatever the source of our pain, we need a healthy view of the already but not yet reality. This is called the already but not yet reality of God's grand plan. Now, the already is this, that the Savior has come. He's given his life. He has risen again, purchasing for himself men from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and every generation for his glory. And so we see that the already has come. Jesus has risen from the dead. The outcome is secure. But you know what? We're not at the final outcome yet. In fact, we're going to go through, now at this point, 2,000 years of leading up to the final outcome. And so we have already that Christ has given us new life in him, but we still have yet to enter the place where the former things have passed away, where death and sorrow and sickness and sin and evil and temptation and failure and all of the things that we deal with, and for slaves, even slavery, all of that is going to eventually be uh, done away with as we see the beauty of Christ's final state blessed upon his people, poured out upon his people. Notice this. Christ has foretold and secured the ultimate victory of redeeming the world through his death and resurrection. But we still await the time when he makes all things new. We still await the time for this final time, this final state of what he has given us. Until then, until then, we are called to faithfully live for his glory in the midst of this fallen world. You see, this isn't just about the injustices of slavery. This is about many difficulties in our lives. This is about the brokenness that we experience even here and now. I mean, there are some people who would say to you and me, I, I cannot imagine the difficulties and the hurts of life and, and all that I'm experiencing being any worse than it is right now. 
And yet God's grace has been poured out upon us so that as we go through the difficulties and the hardships, difficulties very often regarding parents or difficulties very often regarding children or difficulties regarding you know, the struggle within, the struggle of our own mind, our own heart, our own health, and, and the even mental health, there are some of the things that we deal with that are agonizing, but yet we have the great and glorious hope that God is not finished redeeming the world and he's not finished redeeming me. Amen. He's still saving me for his glory and he has made promises to me that I can rest in. Amen. That it is not yet how it's going to be. And this is part of the picture that Philemon is being challenged to recognize that Onesimus is being challenged to recognize. And I want you to see here that Onesimus is carrying this letter back. Onesimus is doing this of his own will. And he is doing this in accordance with the instructions to come and to honor Philemon and to watch God work. So notice here with me as well. In Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, we see this command. And this is in the box on the page that's right in front of you. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything, here's the reason, they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So here were the commands. Number one, five instructions are, are given very quickly, and they're right out of the text. Number one, be submissive. That's in verse 9. Be submissive to your own master and everything. That means don't go in with an attitude rebelling. Look at number two. Be excellent in service. If you're a worker, you work well. You do your job well. However it is that you're called to serve your master, you serve him with distinction. If no other slaves are Christians in that household, it should be said of you, you are the best slave he has. That you, would per, that you would proceed with great service and excellence. Look at the number three. Not to be argumentative. This is the idea. Be respectful. Be respectful. Not argumentative. Don't, when you're told, to don't sit there and fight with him about everything in your life. As you are not argumentative, but you're respectful, then you will show what Christ has called us to be in distinction. Look at number four. Be honest. Don't be pilfering. Pilfering means when you go through somebody's stuff. You go through and you take what you want. You go through and you, you steal and then sell, or you go through and send it off to somewhere else. Don't be pilfering what he has. Don't, don't pilfer with his family. Don't pilfer with the things that he has. Be honest. And then look what it says in verse 10, but showing all good faith. That is, be loyal. That you're going to be loyal to him, and as you're loyal to him, you're going to be showing the world a shocking example. You see, this is radical slavery. This is slavery like the Roman world has never seen. Why would a slave be submissive, be excellent in service, be respectful, be honest, be loyal? You say, well, and especially when you have a slave master that perhaps is an evil slave master in, in a harsh way, and, and you start to see the slave respond back with, with a very strange response of love and loyalty. And we begin to see God do a work. Now, before we're too offended in our sensibilities about, I mean, because I, I, I'm highly offended by slavery. I'm highly offended by wars that seek to go and take one thing from another nation and take, another, you know, take something else. I'm highly offended by oppression. I, 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 those go against my sensibilities on the inside in every way. And I believe that they're wrong and they're evil. But here, when we begin to see this kind of command to live under these circumstances that are societal and that are global and that are political, Christians are called to live distinct lives in the midst of a fallen world. Now, now as I look at this, I think about this one thing, and I want you to see this. Jesus Think with me about the Son of God. Think with me about God. You, you say, well, slavery is so unjust. The oppression of women is so unjust. 
all of this is so evil and it's so wrong. And I would say, I agree with you, but it's not as evil and it's not as unjust and it's not as wicked as what was done to the Son of God, perfect, never sinned. God leaves the halls of heaven. God comes to a world that is lost in its sin. And God willingly lays down his life on the cross of Calvary as he is submissive to the will of the Father, as he lives a perfect life and is a perfect sacrifice. He is excellent in his service. Notice this. He is respectful. He is respectful to the will of God, the plan of God, and he's respectful, listen to this, to women and to children and the people that are all around him. He loves others more than he loves himself. Notice this, he is honest. There was, no, there was no falsehood in his mouth. It says that he went to the, the cross for our sins without uttering a word and a curse. He comes and he is honest in all that he does and he gives. And he is ultimately loyal to his own righteousness. He is ultimately loyal to the obedience of the Father. You see, so when we look and we see the call for old men to live a certain way, young men to live a certain way, older women, young women, elders, church members, slaves that are in the church, all of us are called to live in a way that's counterintuitive to the world around us. And so here we see that it's through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we see something greater than military power. We see something greater than spiritual, excuse me, than social change. We see a spiritual power that changes the world. We see something that rescues men and women from their fallenness and sin. Notice here with me, why should they do this? And it's said right in verse 10, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Here it is because their radical behavior will powerfully show Christ to the society. Their radical behavior will powerfully show Christ to their society. The word adorn, make a note out there to the side, it means to wear, or another way to say it is to show by wearing. So when you adorn a, a crown, you're showing that you're the king. When you adorn a royal robe, you're showing that. When a police officer adorns the badge of his police department, he is showing his authority. It is wearing something for the purpose of showing it. And so when we adorn this kind of radical behavior, we are showing the world Christ. We are putting on the doctrine of God and we're showing the world a different way to live. Notice the next part that is here and fill this in. Why should they do this? Because their true, speaking of the slaves, their true spiritual freedom has already been attained in Christ. Their true spiritual freedom has already been attained in Christ. You see, Christ is the center of the reason and the freedom that he gives is the reason for them to live and to walk. Now, don't put away your sheet yet. I want you to see Romans 6. Cannot miss Romans 6. Here is the picture, the fuel for the whole thing that explains why we would live in this present world honoring God, even when there's injustice, even when it hurts, even when it seems like it would be so easy to do something else. Here's the reason why. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Uh, or we're going to start in verse 20. Look what it says. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. This is talking about spiritual slavery. When you're slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things in which you are now ashamed? You're saying all that stuff you were doing, was it good for you? No, it wasn't good for you. Maybe you lost a marriage back there. Maybe you lost kids back there. Maybe you lost your reputation back there. Maybe all of these hurts and these pains, maybe you lost your health back there. Was all this good for you? No. Look at the middle of verse 21. For the end of those things is what? Death. Verse 22. 
But now that you have been set free from sin and have become what? Slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Sanctification is a big word for, it means to become more like God. So all of these troubles and these struggles, and maybe for the slave, even this slavery that is so wrong and so unjust, as you give your slavery to God, and you say, God, I am living for you in light of what you did for me, I am living my life for you, this becomes the powerful reason for us to see God's glory in our daily lives. We see that Christ has given us this grace. Look at verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life. life. Where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, like so many different things in the already but not yet, as we go through the part that's not yet, We are showing the world what it means to have faith in God, to trust in God, to obey God, to walk with him. And that is what causes people to say, what happened? Why are you like this? This week, I had a conversation with a couple of different people where I heard similar testimonies. That as one couple came to Christ in our church and they began to walk with Christ, family members, in fact, some of the most hostile, anti-Christian, and perhaps difficult family members said, what has changed in you? Why are you like this? And not out of condemnation, but out of interest and admiration. You see, when we are changed by the Savior, and when we live in such a way that people see it, We are professing Jesus Christ, and we need to be ready to say, there's a reason that I live the way I live. Because I believe Onesimus was ready to go back and to show the world what a difference Christ can make in a man and in a culture, in a world. So that is the story of the slave who I believe was used by God to perhaps change the world. Let's pray together.